Well, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that lunch and uh, ha hopefully had a chance to get some of those books signed since we compressed the earlier book signing. Uh, but, uh, you know, for those, uh, you know, get comfortable in your seats for this uh, next session, which is a panel on women at war. Now, women, uh, as, as, as we, we may not always realize, but uh, it becomes uh, clear, played an important role in resisting fascism and Nazi occupation during the Second World War. In this session, archivist and public historian Elizabeth Hyman discusses how women sacrificed their lives to make the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943 possible while best-selling author and former journalist and foreign correspondent Lynn Olson provides a new look at French Egyptologist who used her intellect and her determination to save priceless ancient artifacts from Nazi looting. So, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chairing our session today is uh, Jenny Craig Institute's senior historian, Dr. Steph Hinnerschitz. <laughs> Steph joined the museum in 2021. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Maryland and is published widely uh, and is a award-winning author on topics on the US home front during the war and Asian American history. And so uh, with that, Steph, yeah. over to you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So All right, thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And I wanna reiterate how excited I am to be here on this panel. So today we're gonna to be hearing from Lynn and Liz on their work on the role of women in resistance movements during World War II and their own fight against fascism. Now, this topic of women in resistance isn't exactly new. Historians have been uncovering the role of women in these networks and these nodes for quite some time. Lynn, in her own work, particularly her 2019 book, Madame Fricade's Secret War, The Secret War of Madame Fricade, which looks at Marie Madeleine Fricade, who was a 31-year-old woman who led an intelligence network that was part of the French resistance, she's really at the forefront of this, and she has been. And Lynn has dedicated her career to writing and analyzing political trends, and she brings that determination and dedication to writing many books on World War II, and especially the role of women in the war. And then Liz, as an archivist, she has a special, what I would call like a special power. <laughs> so you always want an archivist on your side because they can hide things for you and cover <laughs> things up, but also because <laughs> they are really good at uncovering new sources. And so Liz is also at the forefront of a new movement and scholarship to uncover the role of women. And she focuses on young Jewish women and how they created and maintained a network of resistance that was part of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. And also as a public historian, Liz is really well situated to bring this story to the public and again use her special powers as an archivist to look for new documents and new resources. The one thing though that I can say is that I'm not quite sure if uncovering is the best word to use because these women, especially the Jewish women in the ghetto, and then also the woman who Lynn will talk about today, so um, Christiane Desroches, who is a, was a leading archeologist at the time, who was responsible for really leading networks to get some of these priceless artifacts out of France and save them from Nazi looting. So both Christiane and the woman that Liz focuses on, when I say uncovering, again, that's not really accurate because these women were well known at the time. They were known among their networks. They were respected for the work they had done. Certainly men recognized and respected the women who they came to know. So it's not really uncovering. Again, they knew that. Historians are discovering more about their roles, but they were certainly no secret. Everyone knew and recognized them at the time. But what we're gonna do in this panel is bring some of these stories to you. And we are going to uncover them in the sense that we're gonna, perhaps you don't really know that much about the topics, but you might not know about this specific woman that we're going to discuss. And I don't think it's 
out of line to say this is a very male conference. <laughs> Most of the panels that we've had are <laughs> male focus. And what we're not trying to do today is just be that women's history panel at this conference. <laughs> what we're trying to do is to get you to think about how essential women are to understanding World War II history. So with that, I will turn it over to Liz to talk about her research. Thank you, Steph. I'm just gonna head over here. It's hard to Could you? <laughs> Thank you, Steph. So I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is the most famous instance of Jewish resistance to Nazi terror during the Holocaust. It has been depicted in every form of media, from comic books to film, yet one element nearly all fictional, artistic, and cultural representations of the uprising have in common is that they all depict it as an exclusively male event, commanded by men, organized by men, and fought by men. If women exist in these depictions, they do so as tragic mothers or silent girlfriends. In reality, young Jewish women played a vital role in every aspect of the uprising. Their contributions were such that I feel comfortable saying that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising could not have happened without the bravery, ingenuity, and action of young Polish Jewish women. When I say young Polish Jewish women, I am speaking of members of the generation born between approximately 1914 and 1924. This distinct generation of Jewish youth shared a series of experiences as they came of age in interwar Poland, which uniquely prepared them for their underground work during the war. Interwar Polish Jewish youth, as a result of a clash between traditional Eastern European Jewish ways of life the modernizing trends of the 1920s and 30s, and systemic anti-Semitism at all levels of the Polish state were an extraordinarily ambitious, politicized, and independent generation. They looked away from the home and traditional centers of Jewish authority for guidance and structure, and found them instead in Jewish political and ideological youth groups, a common feature of European politics in this period. These youth movements commanded their members utmost loyalty. They taught Jewish youth how to act collectively and how to fight for the vision of Jewish life in Poland they wanted to see without waiting for the guidance or permission of their elders. Unlike the older generations, they weren't afraid to practice confrontational politics and they didn't hesitate to demand their rights as Jews from the generally hostile Poles. That said, the older generation did have some influence and control over these young people's education and socializations. Jewish law prescribed that only Jewish boys were required to study Torah. In Eastern European Jewish society, this exemption led Jewish families to provide their sons with a private religious education while sending their daughters to public school. There, Jewish girls were introduced to Polish secular culture, language and customs. They learned to speak Polish without the easily detectable Yiddish inflection of most Jewish speakers and gained both Gentile social contacts and a level of comfort in Polish society that Jewish boys did not have access to. Eastern European Jewish gender roles dictated that after completing his religious education, Jewish men were supposed to dedicate their lives to religious study while their wives went out into the world to earn a living. While this was a cultural ideal as opposed to a reality, the existence of this ideal legitimized Jewish women's presence in the world of business and commerce. These wage earning women in turn raised their daughters to be assertive breadwinners. Therefore, the ambitious, independent, and self-directed Jewish women and girls who came of age in the interwar period were both comfortable in Gentile Polish society and were socialized to fit the ideal of the strong, savvy, capable Jewish woman. When catastrophe struck the Jews of Poland in 1939, these young women became the backbone of the organized Jewish resistance. Nazi Germany and the USSR invaded and partitioned Poland in September 1939. 
In doing so, they threw the youth groups into disarray, cutting their communications with the outside world. To rebuild communication networks, a series of volunteer couriers ran letters and other forms of communication between the isolated Jewish communities of Poland, navigating two distinct occupation authorities as they went. Most of these couriers were Jewish women and girls, some as young as 15. The Nazis began to ghettoize Polish Jewry in 1940. The Jewish population of Warsaw, at approximately 400,000 people, was sealed inside the Warsaw Ghetto in November 1940. The Germans extended this ghettoization policy to eastern Poland and Lithuania upon its June 1941 invasion of the USSR. Within the ghettos, and specifically the Warsaw Ghetto, a patchwork of undergrounds emerged as each youth group organized its own system of covert activity, typically centered at non, sorry, typically centered on education, culture, publications, and mutual aid. Now sealed within the ghetto, the youth groups continued to rely on female couriers for contact with the outside world. In this period, the couriers transported not only letters, but money, illegal literature, forged documents, and rumors of mass executions of Jews. They only had their false identity cards and travel permits, Aryan passing looks, wits, and genitalia, which could not betray their Jewish identity, to shield them from detection as they dodged Nazi inspections and patrols. Any sign of fear, any waiver of confidence could mean death. Out and beside me, you'll see one such false document. These are the false papers of a woman known to us as Vlad Kamid. She's written heavily about her experiences during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And as a courier, I encourage you to look her up and look deeper into her after this uh, session concludes. <clears throat> in light of the courage it took to conduct this work and the role they played in connecting their communities to the outside world, these women's comrades and organizations hailed them as heroes and bringers of hope. Jewish resistance leader Mordechai Tenenbaum wrote the following of Tema Schneiderman, a courageous courier and his girlfriend. Over 20 times she crossed borders that separated different parts of Poland. Tema visited every ghetto, knew Jewish life and troubles in every town and city. She was a living treasure of information. She brought messages from the movement to every area. Even Poles and Germans could not reach every part of Poland as she did. And when she came, there was such joy. Ruszka Korzak, based in Vilna, wrote the following of courier Tosia Altman. Tosia came. It was like a blessing of freedom. Just the information that she came, it spread among the people. That we have Tosia visiting us from Warsaw, as if there was no ghetto, as if there were no Germans, as if there was no death around, as if we were not in this terrible war, a beam of love, a beam of light. After the Nazis realized that a quick victory upon their 1941 invasion of the USSR was not to come, they transitioned from a policy of ethnic cleansing of their unwanted Jews to one of genocide, using death camps and poison gas. In the Warsaw Ghetto, this process began in the summer of 1942. Through a combination of terror, disinformation campaigns, and a reliance on the Jewish insist instinct to cooperate with authorities, between July 22nd and September 10th, 1942, the Nazis deported approximately 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to their deaths at the Treblinka death camp. It was only after the deportations, when none of the 55 to 65,000 Jews remaining in the Warsaw Ghetto could deny the truth of Nazi intentions, that a true united Jewish underground could emerge. And in early October 1942, the Jewish Fighting Organization, or ZOB after its Polish initials, was formed. The youth groups were a vital part of this process and retained their structures under the umbrella of the ZOB as planning for an armed uprising began in earnest. This is when the mission of the couriers turned from information gathering to arms acquisition and rescue. To complete both of these tasks, the couriers had to commit to a dangerous underground life on the Aryan side of Warsaw. 
As they smuggled Jewish children out of the ghetto before the uprising, the couriers were responsible for finding safe accommodations, securing false documents, and managing their care. Each of these tasks was enormously time-consuming, complicated, and risky, and the arrangements could fall apart at any moment as a neighbor or landlord grew suspicious. While making these arrangements, the couriers also had to focus on acquiring guns, explosives, and ammunition, and smuggling them past the German guards into the ghetto. They slept with chemical explosives and instructions for the manufacture of homemade bombs beneath their pillows, and smuggled dynamite into the ghetto through labyrinthine factory passageways. In her memoir, They Are Still With Me, courier and arms smuggler Havka Fulman Raban wrote of one such mission. For a short while, I lived in the same room with Tama Schneiderman. Under the bed was a suitcase containing pistols and grenades. Tema and I brought the grenades to the ghetto. Each of the girls hid a grenade in her most intimate place, her undergarments. From a suburb of the city, we took a streetcar in the direction of the ghetto. I recall our odd behavior during the ride. Tima stood at my side and asked, what would happen if a gentleman invited us to sit beside him? We broke into laughter, hiding our fear in this way. ZOB commander Yitzhak Antek Zuckerman wrote that he would never forget the celebration which took place in honor of courier Frumka Plotnitska when she smuggled the ZOB's first weapons into the Warsaw Ghetto. She'd done it by placing the weapons in a basket of potatoes. When she was stopped by a German policeman, he put his hand into the basket and groped around, but did not notice anything amiss. Stories like these proliferate through the diaries, memoirs, autobiographies, and testimonies of surviving members of the ZOB. Male and female resistance leaders alike made it very clear in their post-war writings that no uprising could have happened without the couriers. Indeed, Sivia Lubetkin, the highest ranking woman in the ZOB, wrote in her memoir that, one cannot possibly describe this work of organizing the Jewish resistance or the uprising itself without mentioning the roles of these valiant women. Many couriers were discovered over the course of their missions. Most were tortured and murdered upon their capture. A courier named Chasia began her underground work in a group of 23 women, and only five of that group survived. When the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began on April 19, 1943, women were vital in all theaters of the uprising. They were sharpshooters, reconnaissance officers, fighters, and commanders. Tosia Altman was charged with using one of the few working telephones in the ghetto to relay information to commanders on the Aryan side, while courier Vlad Kamid was ordered to remain on the Aryan side and continue her rescue work. Zivia Lubetkin, upon the destruction of the main command bunker and the murder of the highest ranking commanders of the uprising, led survivors out of the ghetto through the sewers to the Aryan side of the city, holding her gun aloft over her head the entire time. Much later, after the war, Sivia testified in the 1961 trial of A.F. Eichmann. What I've spoken about today barely scratches the surface of the full extent of these women's actions, and there is so much more to say about each and every one of them. I hope, however, that this has provided you all with a good introduction. Thank you. So I will turn it over to Lynn, talk about her work. Thank you, uh, Steph. It's really wonderful to be back at the World War II Museum. I consider this my second home. Um, and I haven't been here for several years, so it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be with you all. I'd like to start by taking you back to 19, November 1940. General Charles de Gaulle is in London the only French official willing to abandon his homeland to continue the fight against Hitler. It's still early days in the war, but it does not look good for Britain, which is, as you know, the only allied country at that time still fighting the Germans. De Gaulle, though, is optimistic. He decides to create what he will call the Companions of Liberation, an elite group of those that he and his Free French movement considered to be heroes in the struggle to free France in World War II. Those named to this group will include members of the French military and civilians fighting in the resistance at home. 
By the end of the war, only 1,038 people will be considered worthy of this honor. Of that number, 1,038, 1,032 were men. There were six women. So what's the con conclusion to be drawn here? That French women played almost no role in the resistance? Of course, that's ridiculous. Tens of thousands of French women risked and in many cases lost their lives by defying the Germans. They played a crucial role as resistance members, not only in France, but in virtually every other occupied country of Europe. Indeed, one US intelligence officer called women the lifeblood of the resistance. They acted as couriers, collected intelligence, transported arms, escorted allied pilots caught behind enemy lines to safety, hid other resistance members in their homes, and even led armed bands of resistance fighters against German targets. The largest escape network in Western Europe, called the Comet Line, was created and run by a young Belgian woman named Didi de Jong. As was true of other escape lines throughout Europe, the majority of Comet Line workers were women. Let me tell you a little more about what it was like to work for an escape line. It was by far the most dangerous form of resistance work in occupied Europe. The most perilous job of all in an escape line was handled mostly by young women, many of them still in their teens, like the ones Liz talked about, who escorted stranded Allied pilots and other troops hundreds of miles across enemy territory to neutral Spain and safety. Unlike resistance fighters who were in hiding much, if not most of the time, these young women did their work out in the open riding on trains and other forms of public transportation with foreigners whose appearance and actions were often uh, so unlike everyone else around them. Didi de Jong, as it turned out, was one of the boldest, most important resistance heroes of the war, whether male or female. Another was a young woman named Marie Madeleine Forcade, who, as Steph pointed out, at the age of 31, became the leader of the largest and most important allied intelligence network in occupied France. The only woman to, he to head a major French resistance organization, Marie Madeleine was in charge of some 3,000 spies who infiltrated every major port and sizable town in the country. I first became aware of her while I was doing research uh, on the resistance in France for an earlier book of mine called Last Hope Island. I couldn't believe it when I found only scattered references to her in the books and other material I was consulting. It was clear she was a really major figure in the resistance, but there was very little written about her. Certainly there was no English language book about her. So I decided to write it myself. And that was Madame Foucault's Secret War, which was published three years ago. Was Marie Madeleine added to the list of de Gaulle's uh, organization of heroes? No. The only woman who had actually been a chef de resistance and whose network's intelligence achievements were unparalleled was not judged worthy of the honor. The same was true of the woman who is the main character in my latest book, Empress of the Nile, which will be published in February. Her name is Christiane de roche Novocorp. She was a French archaeologist, a trailblazing female version of Indiana Jones, who led what seemed to be a hopeless campaign in the 1960s to save several ancient temples in Egypt from being destroyed. That, that crusade, as it turned out, led to the most important archaeological rescue in history and the greatest example of international cultural cooperation the world has ever known. But before she did that, Christiane was a member of the first organized resistance network in Nazi-occupied France. It was called the Museum of Man Network, named after its Paris headquarters, the Museum of Man, which is France's main anthropology museum. This was an unlikely collection of rebels, 
Most of them were scholars like Christian, who was at that time acting chief curator of Egyptian antiquities at the Louvre. They were anthropologists, archeologists, art historians, museum curators and directors, linguists, writers, and librarians. In the summer of 1940, at a time when almost nobody in France was resisting yet, this relative handful of intellectuals joined together to revolt against the Germans and France's collaborations government in Vichy. Another striking feature of the Museum of Man Network was the major role that women played in its creation. That was very different from most of the later French resistance groups, which were dominated by men and in which women were relegated to supporting roles. Here again, neither Christine Christiane de roche Novocor nor any of the other women who were, were responsible for creating this network were included in de Gaulle's list of heroes. So the obvious question is why? Why was this true? There are a number of reasons, but the main one was simply because they were women. They didn't fit and don't fit into the traditional historical narrative of the French resistance, namely that all its major figures were men. The omission of these women reflects the sexism that prevailed during the war among de Gaulle, the Free French, and most resistance leaders. In their view, men fought and women stayed home. In the words of one of France's most noted historians of World War II, Discrimination based on a notion of inequality between, between the sexes was as solidly rooted in the resistance as it was everywhere else in France. You have to remember that France was at that point a deeply conservative patriarchal society in which women were largely confined to their domestic duties as wives and mothers and still did not have the right to vote. Just think about that. We're talking about the 1940s here, and women in France did not have the right to vote, did not have the right to hold public office, did not have the right to do anything on their own. What these women in the resistance did was not only to stand up to the Germans, but to the mores of their own country, to the idea that women were second-class citizens and did not have a role and a place in this fight. I particularly love the story that I tell in Empress of the Nile about Christiane's arrest by the Gestapo in the town of Moulin in late 1940. She was taken to a large room which was occupied by seven or eight Germans in SS uniforms, several of them leaning back in their chairs, their boots on a desk, smoking cigars. One of them asked her in French if she spoke German. Although she did, she replied, not only do I not speak it, I don't understand a word of it. Right from the start of her interrogation, she said later, I was not willing to be amiable. The Germans refused to believe her claim of being an Egyptologist. To them, she was a spy. In reality, she was both. But she continued to refuse to answer their questions. As the interrogation proceeded, her temper grew shorter and shorter. She'd already had plenty of experience in dealing with arrogant men like these. In the macho, rough and tumble world of French archeology, span women were an extreme rarity, and she'd been shunned and harassed since her earliest days in the field. Even at a moment when her life was clearly in danger, this young Egyptologist could not abide the idea of men refusing to take her seriously. At one point, she scolded the Germans for their bad manners, saying, I can't believe how poorly you were raised. Is this, <laughs> is this any way to receive a woman with your feet on the table? For a moment, they were speechless. <laughs> then they tried to silence me, she remembered, but I kept going. I couldn't stop cursing at them, and they ended up sending me back to my cell. The next, the next day, they let her go. <laughs> this kind of feistiness was not unusual for women resistors during the war. But after the war, they didn't brag about it. 
They didn't say, look at the amazing things I did to win back freedom for my country. In fact, many of them minimized the importance of their achievements. Unlike a number of their male counterparts, they neither demanded credit for their contributions nor asked to be rewarded for them. As the British historian Robert Gilday has noted, after the war, those who had done the least in the resistance often spoke the most. <laughs> While those who had done the most spoke the least. Women, Gilday added, were particularly modest. Even Marie Madeleine Foucault felt obliged to downplay what she had done, describing herself to an interviewer after the war as the wife of an officer, the mother of a family, a member of no political party, and a Catholic. As one French writer aptly noted, it was a rather humble and misleading self-description by the only woman to have led a large and important resistance network in France. So what I and Liz and a number of other historians, mainly women, have done over the last few years is to bring Marie Madeleine, Christiane, and so many more of these amazing women out of the shadows to tell their stories and to finally give them the credit they are due. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn and Liz. I have a couple questions that are more directed to you individually, and then a couple that I think bring your work together. My first question is for Liz, but now that I think about it, I think you could also probably jump in, Lynn, as well. And that would be for you, Liz, as an archivist, mm -hmm. again, your special powers as an archivist, <laughs> what, what were some of the sources that you maybe uncovered or that really haven't been looked at that you use for your work? And then I'll ask the same question to Lynn as well. So I'll start with you, Liz. Of course. I first heard about these women in the graduate school seminar. The professor mentioned a woman named Vlad Kamid who had smuggled weapons into the Warsaw Ghetto. And I hadn't known about her. I was in my third year of graduate school as a, folk, as a specialist in modern Jewish history. So I was... <laughs> slightly outraged. Um, so I began by reading her memoir, and from then I used my special uh, archivist powers to research much more memoir, uh, oral history, diaries, and testimonies. Um, as Steph also mentioned, I am both a historian and an archivist. I work in the field of modern Jewish history, so I have many friends and colleagues at various archives, museums, universities who have these women's writings in the collections of uh, their institutions. So I've been able to find, locate, and source a lot of diaries that way. Um, a lot of these diaries uh, and testimonies and writings, however, have not been translated into English, which has been an ongoing obstacle in these women and their stories really entering public Holocaust memory outside of Israel and small parts of Eastern Europe. So that is the short version of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just I'll tag Lynn in on this as well. Um, well, my writing about women is, is a fairly recent thing. I mean, I've written nine books, uh, most of them about World War II. And most of them, the earlier books, are really about men, because I was writing about various subjects like the Anglo-American Alliance and uh, um, uh, Poland uh, during World War II, and, and because it's about war. It was about men. I tried to include women as much as I could in these these books, but you know the emphasis was was largely male. Um, and then I, I started changing when I discovered all these references in um, about Marie Madeleine Foucault. Um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I just was so struck by her and and what she had done, and the fact that nobody had paid any attention to her that for the first time, I decided to write a book about one person. My earlier books were kind of broad, panoramic stories about an event involving a lot of different characters. But Marie Mallon, she just, just fascinated me so much that I decided to, uh, to, to I mean, there, there's, there were a lot of people in this book, but the through line is Marie Mallon. And um, 
I mean, it was like, I don't know, in a way, coming home. I, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it, I think, writing that book. I mean, I've loved all my books, but I, I enjoyed writing that book uh, more than any of the others. Basically, because, you know, as a writer, it's a lot easier if you have one character that goes all the way through a book. It's a through line that you can, you know, you can, um, you can add, but it, it makes it much easier. But I just was just fascinated by her as a person and what she was able to accomplish. And the same thing with this latest book. I discovered Christiane. Um, I was originally thinking about doing a book about the, um, the network that she was involved in, uh, the, the group of intellectuals. Um, but the more I found out about her, um, the more I thought, oh, this woman, again, has not been written about. Believe it or not, there, was, there is not a French or English book about her. Um, a, a French book has just been published, uh, but um, I, I was just stunned by not only what she did during the war, but more importantly, what she did after the war, which was, was incredibly important. Um, so again, I had a great time. Uh, doing it because both of these women were such extraordinary characters. Christiane is, was more fun in a way to write about because she is just out there, elbows out, as you could tell from that story. Uh, Marie Madeleine was more, um, she, was in she was a spy master, so she was very secretive. Uh, it was hard to put my finger on Marie Madeleine. Um, I, I, it was, People have asked me if I liked her, and I, it's, it, liking her is not the right word. It's I'm in awe of her. Um, I couldn't imagine doing what she did. I can't imagine how she do, did what she did. Christiane was, is a different story. I love her. Um, you know, she was just, uh, she wouldn't let anybody tell her what to do. You know, whether it was de Gaulle, whether it was Nasser in Egypt, or Gestapo officers. Um, so, I don't know if that answers the mm -hmm. question, but it... Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I wanted to ask that question because we always have a survey for attendees to fill out. And I did receive an email, I think it was last week, from an attendee who wanted to know more about how historians come to their work. So what inspired them? Where do you get your sources at? How do you, how do you trace a character through a book? And it seems like both of you are doing amazing work in finding new sources, but also reading against the grain. So trying to get a sense of where women fit in a lot of stories that are dominated by men, so you do have to weave through a little bit and kind of pick out and, and pull out something that would be good for your story. So that was a, a question that struck at Liz, but then I opened it up to, to Lynn, because I think it's important to hear both of you with your sources. So my next question is for Liz, because I do want to make sure I talk about this point of your work, because I think it's really, really important. So like I mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of work that's starting to be done about the role of women in these resistance movements, getting their stories out there, incredibly important. But Liz, what you are also doing is grounding this story in sort of a bigger historical context. Mm -hmm. Both of you are doing that, but Liz, your point about these women are part of a generation mm -hmm. and the generational importance. At this museum, we talk about the greatest generation all the time. And there's a lot of discussion about how accurate is that? You know, what, what does that actually mean? But I think there is something to be said, like you bring up, that these women are young, really young, and they are part of a generation of young Jewish people. So not just young Jewish women, but mm -hmm. teenage Jewish youths in general. So can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of keeping in mind the generational mm -hmm. connection to your women in your yes. work? Of course, the generation of young Polish Jewish people born between about 1914 and 1924 were extremely unique in Jewish terms and generational terms. Um, that generation's parents had grown up in a Poland that was partitioned between three powers, the Prussian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. After World War I, and the Paris peace process, all of the borders were reshifted and reallocated, and we saw the Second Republic of Poland become an independent power for the first time in over 100 years. So they just had a very different social and political context than their parents. Um, in this new Republic of Poland, while it's an immensely complex topic in and of itself that I hate to generalize, but anti-Semitism was a very strong force in Polish nationalism, and after the, de after the death of uh, Joseph Pilsudski in 1920, I'm sorry, 1935, it 
grew much, much more intense, heavily influenced by Nazism. So Jewish youth always came, grew up in understanding that there was this hostility between them and the Poles who were their neighbors. There were some exceptions. Uh, many Polish socialists and communists did not necessarily share this anti-Semitism, but it was a big part of life in Polish society. So Jewish society in Poland was very much forced to be a separatist culture. Jewish society had its own school system, its own cultural institutions, had an incredibly intricate world of warring politics and political parties. And the children, this generation I'm speaking about, found that their parents really had no way to guide them through this new world of independent Poland. They also dealt with the modernizing influences of the 20s and 30s, the new woman, flappers, radio, cinema. So their parents were fairly lost as how to reach their kids and guide them, especially after the Great Depression, as the global economy fell apart and Jews were excluded from the Polish economy. Their parents really lacked the ability to teach their kids how to succeed as adults in the world of late 1930s Poland. So as I mentioned briefly, they very much turned inward to each other and to themselves and joined a wide variety of youth groups, which their parents were not happy about. A lot of the parents would say things like, oh, she's run off to the communists and you know, they'd be writing illegal literature at the kitchen table and fighting with their brothers and sisters about the fine points of Zionism and the Internationale. Um, so it was both a general difference and a difference wrought by geopolitics and long-term forces within Polish society. That's the short version of the answer. It's a great version <laughs> of the answer. I also really like this idea of, of thinking about the greatest generation with your work about. We, we use it here mm -hmm. in the United States, but if you really want to broaden it out, <laughs> Right, we're talking about an entire global generation of young people who are at the forefront in a lot of ways. And actually, I'm gonna, just kind of thinking out loud now, so tag in Lynn as well, with your newest book, which I had the chance to read an advanced copy, and it'll be out in March, and you should definitely, definitely check it out. Um, with, with Christy on, do you see any kind of generational connections with what she is able to do? Is this, is there something going on at the time with how she is able to get into the position that she has as an archeologist? Or is this really her kind of driving her own path? Uh, it was her driving force. No, there was no generational. I mean, <laughs> again, women didn't have the right to vote. I should, I should have said, and I will add this now, do you know when women, French women, got the right to vote? 1944. The war was still going on. Do you know why they got the right to vote? Because of women in the resistance, um, the effects of women in the resistance, the contributions of women in the resistance. Um, Christiane, no, uh, it, you know, she uh, came of age in the 1930s. I mean, she went to the Ecole de Louvre. Uh, she wanted to become an archaeologist, an Egyptologist. And that was just unheard of in, in, in France. So, you know, the, the French archaeology in general, uh, until just a few years ago, was very much of a male club. Um, and they did not want, archaeologists did not really like to have women around. Um, but, but that was particularly true in France. And so it was, it's just her sheer um, willpower, her personality. She grew up in a family in Paris who, and had parents who were incredibly broad minded and basically uh, encouraged their two children, Christiane and her brother, um, to, to be who they wanted. Um, and she was clearly bright and uh, outgoing and um, ebullient from the beginning, and her parents didn't try to put her into the mold of a, you know, a well-brought-up, young um, French girl from an upper middle class. I mean, they allowed her to do whatever she wanted. Um, and, and so she had a rude awakening when she went to school at the Louvre uh, and made it clear that she wanted to be an archeologist. And uh, her, her professors actually encouraged her, but the young men that she went to school with and who later were her colleagues uh, wanted nothing to do with her. In fact, uh, she won a fellowship to a very elite um, French institution in Cairo, uh, the institution of, of uh, archaeology in, in Cairo. And the male, she was the first woman to win this fellowship, and, and the men uh, 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 mounted a mutiny 
and said uh, that she could not possibly be part of it because she would die in the field. They refused to have anything to do with her. Um, and meanwhile, she went out basically and became you know, the premier uh, Egyptologist, uh, much, much more well-known and much more uh, accomplished than they. But she had trouble with men, these colleagues, all her life. Maybe not surprising. Maybe not surprising. <laughs> um, so, Lynn, just to ask you a question, because I think it ties in well with what Liz spoke about. Different, this was a theme yesterday, obviously, our, our whole theme for our symposium was resistance, but thinking about different ways of resistance. Mm -hmm. So, when we heard Liz, we heard some of these great stories about what we might think of as typical acts of resistance, mm -hmm. uh, what, we, what we think of in our, our imagination. Right. But with Christi Christiane and her work with the Museum of Man and that network, mm -hmm. could you maybe give us an example of resistance that might not fit in exactly with what we, what right. comes to mind? Yeah. Um, that, that is a problem. I think not only in France, I'm more familiar with uh, the French resistance, because I've written about it more than, than other countries, but the way resistance is defined, I mean, basically resistance is defined by, um, by combat, by sabotage, by uh, active um, defiance of the Germans, whereas there are all sorts of different kinds of resistance. Uh, women, as I said, who, who hid uh, resistance members in their homes or hid uh, escaped Allied pilots in their homes, that was resistance. Women who provided food uh, to uh, young men um, in the Maquis, in the, in the uh, uh, later on, and in, in, you know, the young men who fled into the mountains and into the, um, you know, the unpopulated areas of France and fought. Um, there, there were all sorts of ways that uh, women could and did help. So, you know, I think the, um, the, the figure is like about the estimate of, of active uh, resistance, resistance in France is about 200,000, which is a very, very small number. I think that number is far, far greater because uh, historians have not included these kind of support roles. Um, but these support roles are not you know, they weren't danger free. In fact, if, if these women were caught, and many of them were, um, many of them were sent to concentration camps, a lot were executed. Um, so it, it, the resistance, the French resistance, has been defined by men right from the beginning. The, the main culprit, if you will, the culprit is too hard, harsh a word, but is General de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle and his Free French basically defined for history, how the resistance was going to be seen. And that um, has, still has its effects. Um, it, I think historians are gradually beginning to um, uh, widen that uh, definition, but it, it really had an impact. Just like Winston Churchill, I've written a lot about Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, um, um, I'm gonna be, basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm gonna be great in history because I'm gonna write it. And, and that's what he did. I mean, Winston Churchill's definition of, of Britain's role in World War II has, has held sway, um, um, you know, s since then. I mean, again, a lot of, of writers are, are coming out and, and saying, well, that's not exactly what happened. But um, de Gaulle really had a major impact on how um, the idea of defying the Germans was going to be perceived. Um, by later generations. Excellent, thank you. So I will have one more question for both of you before I turn it over to the audience for Q&A. And that goes back to the point that I brought up at the beginning of our session. What does incorporating your examples, the women you focus on, back into the story of resistance, how might that change our understanding of World War II? I know that's a huge question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> um, for me, I think what it changes is the idea that it wasn't special people. I mean, it wasn't um, you know these these larger than life heroes uh, that won World War II. It was ordinary people. 
and uh, a lot of those ordinary people were women. You know, that, that, that's one thing that I've tried to uh, emphasize, especially with uh, the Marie Madeline Fricard book. Marie Madeline Fricard never, ever, ever uh, tried to, uh, she, there was no self aggrandizement about her. She, she didn't want to talk about herself. What she wanted to talk about were those 3,000 people, those spies. Those spies were not trained spies. They were housewives, they were farmers, they were fishermen. Um, you know, they came from every walk of life in France. Um, but their common denominator was they were not going to let the Germans take away their freedom. They were going to fight back. They were ordinary people. And I think that's what this story teaches us, that ordinary people can do extraordinary things if they stand up and fight together. Excellent. And building on what Lynn said, a lot of which can be applied to the women I'm working on, I'm going to answer this question both in terms of World War II and the Holocaust and the way we remember both. Um, I think within both fields and both forms of memory, there remains an unfortunate idea that Jews went like sheep to the slaughter. Um, that has been challenged in recent years within the historiography, but I think not only what focus on Jewish resistance, but focus on Jewish women within the resistance can do is really demonstrate that these were ordinary people fighting not to be heroes, not to be war heroes, not because they had delusions of grandeur about being soldiers, but because they were people and refused to simply sit down and watch as their people and their communities were destroyed. In fact, you know, a lot of people misunderstand the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and similar movements. They were not fighting to win or because they thought they could beat the Germans. They had no expectation of surviving. They were fighting to assert their humanity as people and as Jews. So I think if these women and the women Lynn has and is writing about can change our understandings of World War II and the Holocaust, it's to understand the role of quote unquote civilians, women's and Jews and to bring them back into this already massive narrative. Excellent. So I want to thank uh, Lynn and Liz for their presentation. <laughs> and I thank will you to all three of our panelists. Uh, wonderful conversation. That's why we have Simone on the front cover. If you haven't read about her, please uh, flip through. Before we get to the first question, it's my honor to introduce someone we'll all hear from tomorrow. And that is our dear friend, uh, Nicole Spangenberg, who served in the French resistance as a teenager. Nicole, could you please wave or stand? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, questions, please raise your hands. Great, we'll start with someone we recognized yesterday and we'll hear from this afternoon, Tony Krzyzewski. Well, two questions. I understand that uh, one question that there is, after World War II, uh, a book was written about, in Jewish, in Canada, about the role of the women in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, it never was published in English, apparently. Is it true? And the second question is about uh, Christina Skarbek, who was a favorite spy of Winston Churchill, who was active in France most of the time. Could you talk about that a little bit? I'm so sorry, could you repeat your first question? And the first question was about the apparently book about the role of women in the Warsaw Ghetto, published in Jewish, apparently either in Canada or in, in Israel after World War II. Okay. And it was never published in English. It should be, probably. Mm. Um, and the second question is about uh, Christina Skarbek, a Polish-Jewish uh, spy in, in France, who was a favorite spy of Winston Churchill. And for the second question, uh, Nicole and Steph will actually talk about that tomorrow. Yes. Are you aware of this, uh, this memoir, this diary in Hebrew, Liz? So, um, Sylvia Lubetkin has a memoir in Hebrew. A lot of the memoir literature is in, also in Polish and Yiddish. 
the vast majority of the available English versions and editions are translations, and many have not been translated. Um, Dr. Samuel Casso, who wrote Who Will Write Our History, is working on extensive uh, translations of um, Rachel Auerbach's memoirs. She was an incredible figure. She was part of an underground cell in the Warsaw Ghetto of historians who were charged with writing the history of the ghetto as they realized what was going to happen to them. She's an incredibly important figure who also was massively disrespected by her colleagues at Yad Vashem after the war. And unfortunately, her memoirs are only just now being translated. Um, and I encourage you all to look at Dr. Kassav's work, Who Will Write Our History? It's a really fascinating look at a very specific type of underground work in the Warsaw Ghetto. Next question is gonna to be to your left, ladies. Okay, so first of all, um, it's just great having this female panel. I mean, I can't tell you how good that feels for me. Um, I just wanted to give um, a quote I heard not long ago about the Ukrainian struggle. Um, and it came, of all things, uh, from Zelensky. Uh, he was being interviewed uh, with his wife by Christiane Annenpour, and it was translated when he, they were asked about the thousands of women fighting in the Ukrainian army. And what he said was, bravery has no gender. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Thank you. Yes. We're gonna go to the center, to your left, ladies. This is a question for Liz, and I know it's a broad question. I apologize for that. But now contemporary Poland, mm -hmm. how do they look at the Warsaw Uprising mm -hmm. and also the role of women in it? Okay. That's a very fraught question. Um, in the recent years, there has been Polish nationalist pushback against various ways historians understand that Poles treated Jews and handled Jews during the Holocaust, including um, Jews in the resistance. So when these women are discussed in Poland, which they are, lots of young Polish Jews are very interested in Polish Jewish history in Poland. When they're spoken about these days, it's within the context of pushing back against a Polish movement which very much wants to diminish conversation about roles, the roles of Poles in the Holocaust of Polish Jewry, and emphasize the victimization of Poles under Hitler's regime. So the conversation that does exist is extremely small and exists within this very specific contentious political context. I'll also say that in terms of memory work, I mainly look at how Poland remembers the Holocaust in general. In terms of these women, much of that literature would be in Polish journals, which I have not yet explored. Um, that's an excellent question, though. Thank you. Next question is to your left with Connie, please. Uh, Liz, could you talk a little bit about um, how women in the resistance are uh, commemorated or remembered in Israel today? Mm -hmm. Hannah Senesh is the you know, most famous woman resistor, and she's remembered as a poet, a very brave person, mm -hmm. maybe less so as a um, woman. And Israeli society has historically been very liberal in terms of women in government, in the army, mm -hmm. but also is a conservative society religiously and culturally. So how do those themes all blend together mm -hmm. in Israel today? Sure. First of all, I'm so glad you mentioned Hannah Senesh. She's one of my heroes. I learned about her before I learned about Vladka. She's incredible. Now, this question inevitably ties into issues of Israeli state building and Zionism, and I truly don't want to make any political statements on that uh, situation. But in the immediate post-war years, there was real, real interest by David Ben-Gurion and some of the more centrist Zionist parties in creating a version of Jewish history during the Holocaust, which was very male, very militaristic, very masculine. Now, some women, such as Sivia Lubetkin and her husband, Yitzhak Zuckerman, were elevated as heroes within this very militarized vision of a Jewish past. Um, but as time went on, especially within Yad Vashem, as I spoke about, 
The Jewish men who had not been in Poland during the Holocaust, these were men who had been in the Jewish community of Palestine before the Israeli state was created in 1948, were very much invested in creating this male militaristic memory of the Holocaust. Um, if you look at actually the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Fighters in Warsaw today, it's all men. Um, this trend began to change in the 70s and 80s. However, Israeli society, uh, as it moves between the left and the right and navigates how it speaks about the Holocaust within its own politics and its own state building projects, the women will be invoked depending on how a politi uh, political shift in Israel wants to remember the Holocaust. That's the very short answer to that question, which as I'm sure as you can see, to truly answer that, you'd need you know, a very long book to speak about <laughs> Israeli state building, Israeli nationalism, and various Israeli political parties. Thank you. We're gonna go to the back to your right, ladies. Thank you, ladies, for an amazing panel. And I have a question specifically for Lynn, and that is, what were de Gaulle's criteria for these six women that he included on his list? And, and was Rose Volant, uh, the curator of the Jeux de Pomme, one of them? Uh, to answer your second question, question first, no, Rose Volant was not one of them. Uh, for those of you who don't know who she was, um, she was... She was, she was a spy. She was a spy uh, in, at the Jeux de Palm, part of the Louvre, uh, when the Germans uh, started uh, plundering art from Jewish collectors and uh, patron owners um, uh, of art. Uh, she was, she was the, the woman who was in the Jeux de Palm um, documenting what was being stolen and where it was going. She, she, she risked her life. She was doing this under the um, auspices of the Louvre, of, of the head of the Louvre, um, and she was risking her life every day um, to find out where um, all these masterpieces uh, were going, and, and she did, and then at the end of the war, she went to Germany and, and, and personally helped to, to get them back. Um, uh, so she is a great heroine, but she was not on this list. The, the six women who were on the list were basically associates of men who were on the list. Um, you know, they were assistants or whatever. There was one actual real uh, leader whose name has just escaped me. But the others were basically either wives or um, had been working with uh, a, a, a resistance leader who was on the list. Next question is to your left in the front row. Thank you. Uh, for, this is a great panel. So uh, staying with de Gaulle, um, when they liberated Paris that evening, he had, uh, made a proclamation that Paris had been liberated by the French, right. which ignores the contribution of a few other people. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, just a few, just a few, yeah. So, and I, you wonder, it's purely political, trying to rehabilitate, you know, the role of the French military. And I just wonder, when he ignored women in uh, the underground, was he again ignoring uh, people to the favor of rehabilitating uh, the male role, or was he just a chauvinist? Well, you know, I mean, was it, was it that simple, or was it more of a political... Uh, thought and then finally, just how is the role of women in the resistance in France viewed today? Uh, good question. Now, if I can remember all the um, the first one about De Gaulle, whether it was a, a political ploy, um, yeah, I think it was. I mean, w De Gaulle did get up and and that first day back in Paris, and then he continued this that uh, to the people of France. Uh, you were the ones who liberated uh, Paris. You were the ones who liberated France. That most of the French were resistors, which is absolutely not true. Um, but I think he was doing it basically because France was really, as you know, humiliated by the war. They were the only Western government that capitulated. 
uh, to uh, the Germans. They had a, a, a collaborationist government in Vichy. Um, and I think it was to, his rationale was to help build up, rebuild national pride uh, in France at the expense of the truth. Um, and unfortunately, his statement the, the French um, liberated France uh, had really weakened the arguments about how important the resistance was. The resistance was important. It was very important. But the resistance did not liberate France. The resistance helped those military, the, the Allied military who came in to liberate France. Um, but there, there, to this day, there are arguments about how important the, the resistance was, and I think a large part of it stemmed from de Gaulle's, uh, you know, statement that in fact it was the French who liberated France, was, which was not true. Um, your second part of your question was about women, and, and was he in France? Um, the role of resistance, it, it's it's better. Um, I mean, for example, Marie Madeleine Foucault is, uh, is known to some extent in France, uh, where she wasn't known at all here. Um, but it's still, France, you know, I said was a patriarchal country. In many respects, it still is. Uh, it hasn't really changed all that much. So the male, the male uh, outlook is, is still paramount. If you go, if, if any of you have been to, Les Invalides, you know, into, they, they have a, a, there's a museum of, of, um, of the Order of Liberation. I mean, this, this group that I talked about, the uh, um, Companions of the Liberation, there's a big um, gallery, huge gallery in, in Les Invalides, um, and it's all about men just all about men. And then finally, if you turn a corner in the way in the back, there is this tiny little exhibit to Marie Mellon and her alliance network. It's, it's, it's about half the size of this table. Um, and that, that's still how, I think, how, how the French basically view the resistance is still uh, basically dominated by men. I think your second part of your question was whether he was a sexist, or I mean, whether it was, he was just misogynistic, or whether there was a reason behind him ignoring women. I think it's, it's basically because he, he felt that um, he was just focused on the men who, who were in the military, the men who were leaders of the resistance, and he didn't think at all about the, you know, the role that women played. Next question is going to be to your right. Uh, this question is for Lynn. I've read five of your books, love them all. Can you tell us a little about Christiane after the war and her later life? And yeah. Legacy? I promise I'll buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christi I mean, the, the great thing about Christiane is that, you know, the, the first part of her life in the resistance is really interesting. The re rest of her life was, was by far her greatest uh, achievement. Uh, as I said, she was the one... Uh, in, in, in the 1950s, uh, Nasser, the Egyptian president, decided to build a Naswan Dam, a, a huge, huge dam that would flood uh, more than 20 of, of, ancient, of Egypt's most ancient temples, most priceless temples. And she started a campaign that n nobody thought was going to work um, to save these temples. Uh, in the end, um, it did save the temples, despite Cold War tensions, despite huge problems. So she helped save it. There was another woman who, there were two main characters in this fight, Christiane and another woman by the name of Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, Jackie Kennedy persuaded her husband to provide the funds uh, that ultimately saved the temples. Uh, so that's a great story. But her story doesn't end there. Because of what she did, Nasser uh, allowed uh, the Louvre, to ha hold the first exhibition of King Tut's treasures uh, in 1967 under her curation, under her direction. And it was in thanks for what Christiane had done. That exhibition was 
a huge blockbuster. It was the first one, and it started the whole Tut craze. You know, this is 1967, then, then London did it, then New York did it, and, and various other cities. Some of you may have even seen um, the exhibition when it was in the 70s. So she was responsible for that. Uh, one of her last things she did, she, she was active as an archaeologist until her 90s. Uh, and one of the last things she did at the Louvre was to um, get the, the mummy of Ramses II, who is the most famous pharaoh in Egyptian history. It was, it was, it was uh, being eaten, eaten alive. It was being eaten by, uh, by uh, insects, etc. She persuaded uh, Sadat and uh, um, the president of, Paris, uh, president of France to bring Ramsey's mummy to Paris and had it irradiated and, and saved it. So, I mean, this woman, she didn't, she didn't stop. She didn't give up. She died at the age of 97, and she was still um, you know, working on projects the day she died. And you'll have to come back March 8th when Lynn <laughs> is coming back to give a book talk here. We have a question to your right, ladies. Hi, thank you for this really excellent panel. I was wondering, are there any examples of Asian women in the Asian theater doing any kind of uh, resistance? That is an excellent question. I don't know the, I, I, I know there were, but I don't. I, Our moderator staff is actually best poised to speak to yes. So I, and, <laughs> and I'm just going to say that there's someone in the audience, Desiree, who, I don't know if she's here or not, but she was introduced yesterday at the symposium, and she is working on Filipino women oh, who were wow. part of the resistance yeah. in the Philippines. So I, again, I don't know if she's here or not, but she mentioned before this panel that she was excited for it because she is also working on women in the Pacific theater. So yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if I may add to that, women in the uh, Asia Pacific theater were also dealing with a violent imperialist power which viewed them as less than human. So I'm gonna guess based on what we know of Europe that these East Asian women were not different. They had the same struggles, they saw the same attacks on their humanity and they had similar responses. Um, that is a historical conjecture. I'm not speaking based on fact, but based on what we know of people in World War II, I'd say it's quite likely. And I'm sure that Dr. Bing or Dr. Jose or Desiree or Marie would love to have a continued conversation. Ladies, the last question is going to be to your left in the front row, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, to uh, say something briefly about Holland, the, the, the case of the Netherlands. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Hanni Schoft, mm -hmm. the, the woman with the red hair. I'm not sure how many people have heard of her. Um, but I, was, I find it quite interesting. We, and, and Frank, Anna Frank is, of course, an iconic figure that everyone around the world knows. But at least in the Netherlands, uh, the girl with the red hair, Hanni Schoft, is also pretty well known. Um, and my question is about um, uh, actually, the, the political persuasion of women activists. Hani Schoft was also a communist. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering about, in your two cases, um, in France and in Poland, uh, about this intersection between um, um, uh, women participating in the resistance and, and, and left-wing politics. Obviously, at least the claim is that, that there's also a liberation aspect there too, although there was a lot of patriarchy in the, mm -hmm. on the left as well as the, the right. And I was wondering also about the, the, after the war, how that might have influenced narratives and how much attention women got. Because the interesting thing with Hani Schoft is on the one hand, um, she, in some ways, got uh, she and others who were on, who were communists got got uh, it became kind of an amb more ambivalent in the Cold War uh, because of that communist association. And then on the other hand, um, sometimes they're depoliticized so that we they're remembered as women, but not as not for their politics. So I wanted to ask something about that. Thank you. Do you want to start? Um, I will start. Um, Jewish politics and in interwar Poland were. If Twitter existed back then, it just would have been on every listicle and followed by every Jewish blogger. It was dramatic, it was fractured, it was intense. Within the Zionist movements alone, you had at least six different left-wing socialist Zionist movements by the late 1920s. 
and at least five different middle of the road general Zionist parties, and they all had their attached youth movements. None of those politics went away in the ghettos as we move into the Holocaust. In fact, um, the Jewish fighting organization couldn't really form before very late in the game because these various Jewish political factions could not see eye to eye. Um, the Bund, which was a very complex movement, but for our purposes, was a form of Polish and Jewish Yiddish-based socialist nationalism. They did not want to go to come to the table with Zionists because they perceived Zionists as a very middle-class capitalist bourgeoisie movement. It was only in the face of genocide that they were like, okay, we'll sit down. Likewise, um, these political fact, um, divisions were very much mirrored in the couriers. I'd say the couriers were a bit more common sense oriented than some of the male leaders. And they were more like, this is really bad, you guys. We need to, we need to organize something. Um, we also had a group of very far right wing Zionists who would identify, would have ident and did identify themselves as fascists, who formed their own break off organiz organization because they did not want to work under the structure of the rest. A lot of these political divisions are sort of no longer part of the story because this intense world of Jewish intellectualism and politics was destroyed and died out with the few survivors. So that's a very short version of the answer to that question. I think in, in France, certainly, and you're right, in, in Holland, um, the resistance early on, uh, there was a heavy communist uh, contingent in, in most of the Western countries. And they did, those, those groups did tend to have more women than the others, there's no question. Um, and, and, the, and that they were much more, um, they weren't just, you know, in support of roles. They were actually out there fighting. Um, um, it's interesting. Marie Madeleine Foucault actually was a, from the right. From the right, she was, uh, but she was unusual uh, in that regard. Well, ladies, Steph, Liz, Lynn, thank you very much for a wonderful panel.